Tonight on John News Prime, retired Auditor General Daniel Domlevo makes his first public comment since he was forced into retirement under controversial circumstances last week. I would like to thank His Excellency, the former President John Dramani Mahama, who appointed me as the Auditor General of Ghana. I thank him for the opportunity to serve my motherland. I also like to thank His Excellency, the President, Nana Adudangwa Akufuado, for working with me. A coalition of CSOs against corruption has meanwhile accused the presidency and the audit service of unfairly targeting the retired Auditor General. The state believed that Mr. Domlobo was born on 1st June 1960 because the audit service board chair had decided that this is the date that he prefers. Is that how dates of birth are determined in this country? The CSOs are urging Mr. Domolovo to drag government to the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. We urge the Auditor General to take action against the Audit Service and the Presidency for administrative injustice. Minority raises alarm at the rate at which the country's untapped resources are being given away for loans. Warning, it leaves future governments with virtually nothing is that after borrowing so much, we have now crossed the IMF debt sustainability threshold of 70%. Ghana's debt to GDP ratio, according to Bank of Ghana, is 74.4%. Vice President calls for collaboration among petroleum industry players to build refineries in Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic also in the bulletin, brother of a 43-year-old woman who was allegedly murdered by the husband in their matrimonial home at East Legon says she was the victim of abuse. My name is Israel I. Joining us Prime is coming to you live from our final studios at Kukum Limli here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is a home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Do stay tuned in. Retired Auditor General Daniel Yao Domlovo has revealed President Kufado played a part in his acceptance of the appointment by former President John Mahama in 2016. The appointment was one of those made by Mr. Mahama just before he left office after losing the 2016 election and which was criticized. Speaking for the first time since his forced retirement last week, Mr. Domolovo expressed gratitude to both the president and his predecessor, John Mahama, as well as all Ghanaians. At a Thanksgiving Mass a few hours ago at the Christ the King Catholic Church here in Accra, he explained how the president elect, the then president elect Nane Kufado, reached out to him and encouraged him to take up the job. I would like to thank His Excellency, the former president, John Dramani Mahama, who appointed me as the Auditor General of Ghana. I thank him for the opportunity to serve my motherland. I also like to thank His Excellency, the President, Nana Adudangwa Akufuado, for working with me. In fact, in 2016, when I was appointed and I was confused as to whether I should accept or reject, a call came through from Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe. And after greeting me, he said, hold on for the President-elect. So Nana Adudangwa Akufuado encouraged me and said, go and take the job. That's why I am very grateful to him. I am equally grateful to the board, the management, and staff of the audit service. Some of them are here. And I must say, I'm very grateful to you, and even to the whole public service. I must say to the anti-corruption CSOs or institutions fighting corruption, I am very grateful. If you fight corruption alone, you will not last. Corruption is one dangerous enemy you can't fight alone. And you can't fight quietly. If you qu fight corruption quietly, you will be finished in a minute. So they have been with me to, together with the press. But the press, I'm very grateful to you. 
you have been a big support to me in all that has happened over the years. Meanwhile, the Bishop of the Keta Akachi Diocese of the Catholic Church, Most Reverend Gabriel Kumoji, praised Mr. Dumlovo for reigniting the hope that Ghana could still win its fight against corruption. We are here to appreciate you and to appreciate your family that even for a short while you have really made a mark. You have demonstrated to the world that Ghana is not over. That there are good people in Ghana. There are good and sincere people. There are committed people in Ghana. And if we can all allow our goodness, our sincerity, the values we learned at home, the values we learn in our churches as Christians, the values we learn as people who are educated to rule our country, nobody will be poor, nobody will suffer. And all of us will be able to live as if we are on the promised land. And so we are very grateful for what you have done in this short time, and we are asking God to continue to bless you, to protect you. I told him that at one point I was discouraged that Ghana, in the fight against corruption, we are not going to win. It's like we have lost it. But at least, when he came, he gave us some hope. I will say the hope is not yet long. You have set a tradition. You have set a certain pace. And that is one of the things we are thanking God for. And I know the many people who have to there will continue with that fight. And I know that God will continue to help you to continue with that truthfulness and the value of sincerity and probity. In a related development, the Coalition of CSOs Against Corruption say that says the Supreme Court must urgently resolve the pending cases relating to the Auditor General Daniel Domlovo's forced 167 days leave. The group on Wednesday accused the presidency and the Audit Service Board of unfairly targeting Mr. Domlovo, leading to his retirement. Mr. Domlovo was directed by the presidency to take his accumulated 167 days leave and was later asked to proceed on retirement despite his agreement about his date of birth. The CSOs have been speaking on the matter. There is more in the following news desk report. His diligence and commitment to protecting the public purse, Mr. Domlovo successfully recovered for the state tens of millions of cities in unauthorized spending or misappropriated funds. The Auditor General became a poster boy for anti-corruption crusaders arising from his utilization of his surcharge and disallowance powers. The office of the Auditor General, leveraging his surcharge and disallowance powers, successfully recovered a total of 67.32 million, which is about $11.7 million into government coffers. Second, improvement in asset declaration administration. Under his leadership, the Office of the Auditor General implemented an electronic data system to handle declarations made by public officers with respect to the assets and liabilities. Two cases pending at Ghana Supreme Court both challenged President Akufuado's directive that he proceeds on leave. Mr. Demelovo has since returned from leave and asked to retire. The CSO say the apex court must rule on the cases. The president's action. The suits border on the broader issue of whether or not a president could exercise administrative authority over independent constitutional bodies. Therefore, it is important for the Supreme Court to deal with these suits expeditiously to prevent any such action by a future president in the interest of promoting good governance, constitutionalism, and public accountability. We do call on the Supreme Court to deal with these issues as soon as practicable. We also urge the Auditor General to take action against the Audit Service and the Presidency for administrative injustice. This is a matter that should definitely go to Shraj because I think uh, the, the Auditor General uh, for for the interest of posterity, his own uh, integrity, it's, it's a matter that has to be established as a matter of law. 
that it cannot be uh, just uh, uh, some administrative choice in, uh, to certify that he was born on the day that he says he was not born. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a really an oddity. And the only way you can deal with that is, is to uh, invite Shraj to intervene and allow him to present the documentation that he has made uh, you know, uh, uh, to the board, which the board said it was inadmissible. So the board is now sitting as a judge, jury, and determining whether or not uh, documentation, even formal documentation, is admissible by them or not. The antecedents of the Demlobo matter has left a sour taste in our mouths and led us to question the commitment of our leaders to accountable governance. It is a wake-up call to all well-meaning Ghanaians to be citizens and not spectators, to speak up and not stay silent when such manifestly unfair treatment is better out to individuals who are trying to do their job and to do so with integrity and doing it in the public interest. This is one of the things that we complain about almost on a daily basis. Now, when we find people who are trying to help promote the public interest, you know, we do this to them. Who, which young people are going to follow suit uh, to do what is right? If we want social and economic transformation, silence is not an option. And after 64 years of independence, we owe it to this generation to chat a true democratic path that is inclusive and meritocratic. So thank you all for your attention and God bless you and we'll take your questions. They insist the Auditor General was unfairly targeted. Should the state believe that Mr. Domlovo was born on 1st June 1960 because the Audit Service Board Chair has decided that this is the date that he prefers? Is that how dates of birth are determined in this country? Right, and joining us uh, right now on the phone is Adam Senanu. He is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption and a member of the Coalition Against uh, Corruption. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Senanu. Now, since this news conference uh, this afternoon, I know that you have met uh, Mr. Domlevo, and the comments we're getting from him at the Thanksgiving service, or what we've heard him say is that he's grateful to the president, and he also indicated that it was actually the president who convinced him that he should take up the job when he was offered that job in 2016. Now, what do you make of those comments, especially when we're all thinking, or everybody else, or the coalition is thinking that uh, he shouldn't just let the matter rest? Oh, well, um, I mean, it's a, it was a pleasant surprise to hear from Mr. Domlevo that actually it was uh, His Excellency Narado Danko Akufuado who encouraged him uh, prior to um, taking formally the position of president. Um, that, that was good, and it was great that he said thank you to him as well. It does not take away the fact that um, there's a slur being cast on Mr. Domlevo at the end of his tenure. Um, and we think that those records should be set straight. It's very unfair to him, uh, and it's unfair to everybody else who knows that this man has done the right thing and stood up for what is good for this nation. So our position is that it ought to be taken to trudge. Uh, it's an administrative justice thing. You can't be judged and during your own court, um, as it were, alleged that he has done something wrong. He's not given the opportunity to adduce the evidence to, to, to show that this is not the fact, that's not the truth. Um, and so we want him to take up that. And if he won't, we will take it up on his behalf with we'll charge to all make right. sure that the records are set straight. All right, Mr. Senanu, so here's a case where the man you're fighting for has, uh, does not, his comments, at least for today, doesn't suggest that he, he needs any kind of help. He, he seems to come across as, I'm fine with all that's happening. I don't know where you got that opinion from. It's well, not at least by the, what he He hasn't made that statement. Okay, he hasn't made that statement, but yeah. I mean, he had the opportunity to, to speak, and all he said was he's thankful to the president. He actually yeah. indicated yeah, that. Because he, it was he, a, he didn't want to get into... No, but please, he was at his thanksgiving program, um, and he wanted to stay focused on the fact that he was giving thanks to God and thanks to people. It doesn't take away from the fact that um, if somebody alleges that you have uh, doctored your birth date and so and so forth. 
all of that is, is, is a matter of fact. And all of us who are supporting him know that he's not too happy about that anyway. So that's not, it's not to take away his right to making sure that his name is cleared and that kind of controversy does not stay in the public space over, over, over time. Mr. So, Senanu, does that suggest then probably in your private conversations with him that he intends to hold maybe or come out again and this time, you know, state some facts? No, it doesn't suggest anything. What it does make clear is that there has been an injustice we are all aware. Um, and uh, Mr. Domevo doesn't have to speak for himself. Those of us who engage with him know that this is really unfair to him. Um, if he's so minded as to take it up with charge, that would be great. If he doesn't, we'll make sure that this issue is taken up so that his name is cleared completely. So you're saying that even without his consent, you still go ahead with charge? Absolutely, because we know what the facts are. All right. In your conversations with him, I know you, you met him a short while ago after the, at the mass uh, he held this afternoon. Did uh, you have that kind of conversation? And is he taking up uh, your offer to help him, Ashraf? Well, he did point out that uh, um, he's been advised not to do anything which would be looked at as him having a personal vendetta. Um, and he, he wants to exit peacefully. Um, uh, but yes, uh, he, he notes that this has been put out and there's a lot of documentation out there which is fake. Um, and he's unhappy about that. But beyond that, at this moment, he just wants to give thanks to God. Um, and he notes that, yes, uh, things are flying around, which are unfair to him. Uh, but he's also being advised not to take a position which would seem as if he wants to do something that is personal. We all know for a fact that this is, 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 is just a targeting of somebody who served this nation with the best of what he had. And this is absolutely unfair to him and to all of us. Now, now, finally, you have indicated, the coalition has indicated that, or suggested that he was hounded out by the president. But isn't it interesting that just some uh, four or five years ago, the same man who encouraged him to take up the job is now being accused of hounding me out? Well, yes. And that's part of the difficulty we have when people mount platforms, they make policy statements, and then down the line, we don't see the execution and uh, operationalization um, the way we anticipated. Obviously, um, as people in good governance, accountability, and anti-corruption, we expect much more from our leaders when they um, commit themselves to things like this. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been the case here. We think that Mr. Domlevo has done an excellent job. We think that above many more people who are uh, far in excess of 60 years of age and are uh, uh, handling all kinds of positions and being paid. Uh, all the other chief executives and ministers uh, and whatnot who have accumulated leave, um, the, the trend of how this, the trajectory of what has transpired here, where everybody else who has accumulated leave is still at post, others whose ages are, you know, and somebody who actually has done the right thing is being hounded out of office. We think that this is just totally unfair. So three, four years, the situation has changed. Um, only God knows what transpired to make them take this decision, which is absolutely unfair. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Adam Senanu. Adam Senanu is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption and a member of the Coalition of CSOs Against Corruption. Watch and join us from we're taking a break, but still ahead in the bulletin, minority raises alarm at the rates at which the country's untapped resources have been giving away for loans. Warning, it leaves future governments with virtually nothing. What's done is that after borrowing so much, we have now crossed the IMF debt sustainability threshold of 70%. Ghana's debt to GDP ratio, according to Bank of Ghana, is 74.4%. Stay tuned in, we'll be back in a bit. Welcome back to Join News Prime. The minority has described President Akufado's State of the Nation address as misleading and fraught with factual inaccuracies which do not reflect the true state of affairs in the country. In the view of the NDC MPs, the poverty rate has increased under the administration. 
They also accused the president of ballooning the country's national debt, arguing that the current administration has borrowed 165 billion cities in four years, bringing the country's debt to a total of 286.9 billion cities. This, according to the NDC, means every Ghanaian owes 9,500 cities. The MPs have been debating the president's address on the floor of the House. There is extreme polarization with accentuated poverty among Ghanaians in Ghana. In fact, in the last four years, the Nanadu government has plundered this nation into a quandary. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, December 2016, the total debt of our nation stood at 122 billion Ghana cities. Why I'm saying 122 billion cities because that was what the president told this house in the State of the Nation address in 2017. Mr. Speaker, that is the debt of our nation from the 6th of March 1957 to December 2016. 59 years as a nation, our debt was 122 billion. In December 2020, the debt of our nation has been ballooned to 286.9 billion, according to Bank of Ghana. 286.9 billion, indicating that within the last four years, the MPP government has increased our debt total debt stock by a whopping 165 billion Ghana cities. Was admitting the impact of COVID and how especially the private sector has been struggling. What we did not see was a clear direction, a clear strategy, a stimulus plan to really save the private sector. The president was very proud in talking about how government has succeeded in protecting jobs and incomes of public sector workers. Mr. Speaker, what is the percentage of public sector workers? The business of government is to create the enabling environment for the private sector to create jobs. And we know as we speak today that what the private sector needs. Last two weeks we were hearing we are talking about increasing in taxes and the challenges of simply doing business in Ghana. What is government doing in these critical times to really lower taxes and make it easy? Reduce regulation. Let's see how we are doing on the ease of doing business. And Ghana's position, Ghana's position on the World Corruption Index. Are we improving or, or, or are we getting worse? Are we encouraging people to invest in our country? These are very critical. The sharp rebuttal of the side of the House, the majority side of the House, argue that the address delivered by the President is top-notch and reflects what pertains in the lives of people. The MPs observed that in spite of the pandemic, President Akufadu demonstrated leadership by easing the burden of the pandemic on Ghanaians. ...public for giving us a state of the nation which was very appropriate and apt about what is happening in Ghana. Just because the state of the nation address has two aspects the historical aspect and the current aspect. Mr. Speaker, it was exciting to hear from the President about the Obatamba Cares Ghana program. This Obatamba program is a program to bring 100 billion dollars, 100 billion cities into the economy to really transform the economy from post-COVID or COVID times to post-COVID situations. Mr. Speaker, those of us who are in education uh, we're very excited about Obatamba because the first project under Obatamba is supporting commercial farming. The second project is about building the country's light manufacturing sector. The third project, Mr. Speaker, is developing engineering machine tools and ICT digital economy. Those of us in education and training see it as digitizing Ghana's education. Mr. Speaker, the fifth project, sixth project, establishing Ghana as a flat regional hub, translates into education as establishing Ghana as an educational hub in the West Africa sub-region. 
Still in Parliament, the minority is warning the rate at which the current MPP administration is exploiting future revenue due to the country will leave subsequent governments with virtually nothing to run the affairs of state. The opposition MP cite, among others, the collateralization of get fund revenue for 10 years and the monetization of cocoa trees for $600 million for a period of seven years. MP for Isunafu South Eric Opoku says the practice amounts to mortgaging the country's future is that after borrowing so much, we have now crossed the IMF debt sustainability threshold of 70%. Ghana's debt to GDP ratio, according to Bank of Ghana, is 74.4%. Even though IMF projects 76.7%, Bank of Ghana is saying 74.4%. But whatever it is, we have crossed the threshold. That gives the indication that Ghana now finds itself in a situation where we borrow to pay interest on loans and we have nothing or little for investment in productive areas that can engender growth, create jobs and reduce poverty in the country. That is the situation now. So government wanted to have a scheme to borrow but not add the amount borrowed to the public debt. So what they decided to do is to securitize future revenues future Mo revenue. yes monetize future revenues like the get fund mm. you know through the get fund Ghanaians pay for the development of education mm. now in the next 10 years they've taken 1.5 billion from the chinese so when you pay that tax that money should go to the chinese so, so a sizable percentage of the get fund now belong to the chinese because of the securitization because of the 1.5 billion dollars they've taken and that is for a, a period of for 10 years. 10 years. Yes. A decade. Yes, a whole decade. So in the next 10 years, we are going to have challenges in respect of education financing. And that is the challenge now. Then you go to the energy sector. You realize that you, you know of this energy sector debt, the legacy debt. Yeah. It has been there for a long time. But President Mama decided to take a bold decision to deal with it once and for all. That was why in 2015 he introduced the Energy Sector Levies Act. You recall the controversies that emerged after its passage. Well, MP for Lembele, Emmanuel Amakofi White, asking the president to reinstate Dom uh, Daniel, the retired uh, Auditor General Daniel Domlovo, to demonstrate his commitment to the fight against corruption. I think the president made a quote mm. that in this uh, period of global pandemic and the difficulties and the hardship that the people of Ghana are facing right. and the reality that we must protect the power of the pest, we must do things that will protect the interest of Ghanaians and make sure that we protect their interests and not make them poorer. Right. That's what he himself said. Okay. And so I said as a commitment, the president must reinstate the Auditor General, and for good reason. The overwhelming majority of Ghanaians believe that this Auditor General was doing a good job. Mm. The overwhelming majority, and that's the truth. The President can do his own uh, uh, survey. And the overwhelming uh, Ghanaians also know that the reason why this Auditor General is in trouble is because he stood up to one of a very powerful government uh, appointees. Oh, that may be a bit misleading because the, matter, it was, may be. the, it may the be. matter was taken to court. It may be the, real, the, court the reality is that right. it's not a court that has sacked him. It's the president who is asking him to go. And, and this I, man has attained his retirement age. Well, that's, that's really not the issue. I mean, we've listened to the back and forth. Yeah. I'm saying but in that... in spite of the discrepancies, he's no, don't, attained don't, retirement age. Don't, uh, and it is proper... He says he has one year left. Were you there when he was born? Mm. Were you there? The man says he has one year left. You're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break. Up next, we're bringing you business. Stay tuned in. Hello, good evening. Time for business. I'm Charles IT. Now, the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Balmia, is calling on petroleum industry players in Africa to consider partnerships in building petroleum storage facilities and refineries. Now, his call follows the protectionist move adopted by some major oil producing countries and the emergence of COVID 19. 
According to him, the establishment of such facilities will help the continent to be self-sufficient in such events where national oil companies may not be able to meet the demand of the continent. He made the call in his opening address at the virtual petroleum conference hosted by the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributor, Ghana. The COVID-19 pandemic and the protectionist interventions by major suppliers to Africa is a wake-up call for African nations to cooperate more in building a self-sustaining continent. While national refineries may be commercially unsustainable in some cases, we should be cooperating in the development of regional assets, including refineries and logistical assets to achieve the economies of scale required for commercial viability. This drives productivity and puts our able youth to work, which in turn preserves and enriches their dignity. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is said to become the largest free trade area in the world with a market of 1.2 billion Africans. It is expected that Africa's combined GDP of 2.5 trillion US dollars will reach 29 trillion US dollars by 2050, riding on the back of the AFCFTA and an expansion in intra-African trade from its very low base of some 15%. Well, still on that, the Secretary General of the African Continental Future Agreement Area, Wamkele Mena, is optimistic that various plans to put Africa in place and that the AU to move industrialization to the next level will support a major transformation in the petroleum sector of Africa. Without the petroleum industry, without value addition uh, in the petroleum industry, the development of uh, a beneficiation capacity in Africa, the trade that we seek to boost in Africa will not be achieved to the same level as we would, as we would if petroleum industry was part of the value chain of uh, Africa's industrialization. The petroleum industry is absolutely an integral part of Africa's industrialization as we seek to develop a refinery capacity, as we seek to develop a minerals beneficiation capacity on the African continent, it is absolutely critical that we do so, leveraging on the African continental free trade area and leveraging on the markets that it opens um, uh, in Africa. We should strive to be more of a net exporter than a net importer of, uh, uh, re, of uh, refined petroleum products. We should strive to make sure that we rely less on uh, the exportation of crude oil to other countries for them to uh, refine our products for us and sell them back to us. This is what um, the African continental free trade area is all about. And that's how we end business for this edition. We come your way after 8 p.m. I'm Charles Aite. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment with me, Rick Wampo. For we do start off with the biggest story making the rounds on the local scene, and that has to do with Asante Kotoko striker Kami Opoku, who is close to sealing a transfer to Algeria after an outstanding debut season with Ghanaian giants Asante Kotoko. According to Insurance FM Sports, Opoku's agent Philip Baini has confirmed the striker is heading to USM Algeria. The deal is expected to be finalized this week. We do have more for you in the following report. 
Kotoko will reportedly earn 300,000 euros from the transfer of Opoku, who has been their best player this season. The report adds Opoku has agreed to sign a three-year contract and will receive 15,000 euros per month. Opoku's last game for Kotoko was today's Ghana Premier League outstanding match against Ken Faisal. He joined Kotoko in October 2020 from second tier side in Kranza Warriors and has been in great scoring form. Opoku is Kotoko's top scorer with eight goals in 19 games across all competitions. Should the move be successful, Opoku will be the second high-profile player to leave the Ghana Premier League. Daniel Lomote was the first as he secured a lucrative transfer to Algerian top flight ES Satif in January after scoring eight goals in the league. Still talking transfers, Ghana Premier League side, uh, you know, Ebusia Drafts have confirmed the signing of Japanese striker Jindo Morishita. Now, the 25-year-old will play for Drafts until the end of the current season. Jindo Morishita has a strong aspiration to build a new relationship between Japan and the African continent, especially Ghana through football. Senpar Holdings sponsored the signing to join the Ghana Premier League side, Cape Coast Mysterious Ebusia Drafts. And Sam Power Holdings is also a wholly owned Ghanaian power producer, which partners, among others, Sumitomo Corporation, a leading Japanese Fortune 500 global trading and business investment company. Drafts are currently ninth on the league log with 23 points after the first round. Remember, Jindo Morishita makes history as he would become the first Japanese to play in the Ghana Premier League. Let's see what he asked to this Abishan draft side in the second round of the Ghana Premier League. But to some more stories where president of uh, the Ghana Football Association, Keto Kraku, believes Ghana football would rub shoulders with the best teams in the world with the right investment. He made the disclosure when the Black Satellites presented a 2021 Under-20 AFCON trophy to the president Sinanado Danko Yokufado at the Jubilee House last night. Here's a report by Joy Sports Muftar Nabila Abdullahi. President of the Ghana Football Association, Ket Okreku, called on the government of the country to throw their weight behind football to ensure continued success. Ghana football has a lot of potential. Indeed, the investment levels that this team has seen has resulted in the victory that we are all cherishing and celebrating today. But it is also true that if association football gets absolute and maximum support, not only from government, but also from the public sector, football can take Ghana into millions of homes. Football, perhaps, can also assist us in our hospitality, in our tourism strategy. Football, perhaps, is the most powerful tool that touches every heart in the world. Football brings everybody together. And it's our hope that your avowed mission of ensuring that all our national team coaches are paid monthly will see the light of the day. Our coaches are ready to go the extra mile to bring glory. Our players are ready. The management is ready. Kurt Okreku is confident that winning the Under-20 African Cup of Nations is not going to be a one-off. He said, with continued support from the government of the country, the GFA will put Ghana football at the highest pedestal. Mr. President, I remember very well one important question that you posed to me. And your question was very simple. When would we start to bring back the trophies to Ghana? When would we start to love our sport called football once again? Mr. President, our appearance here is to give you a small taste of what the future holds for Ghana football. And our belief is that with the right level of support, just like we received on the journey to Benin and to Mauritius, this will just be the tip of the iceberg. And Ghana will bring back the love. Ghana will win more trophies. And Ghana will be at the apex of not only African football, but world football. The Black Satellites of Ghana won the Under-20 African Cup of Nations Championship after beating Uganda 2-0 in the final. 
Now, before we go in about eight minutes, Barcelona would be looking for a miracle, one that they had just about four years ago against the same opponents when they beat them by six goals to one to complete one of the most remarkable comebacks in Champions League history. This time, they need at least four goals against the same side in Paris Saint-Germain in Paris. And we're bringing you live commentary of that match on Joy 99.7, which starts in just about five minutes. So you can head there in case you're interested in FC Barcelona versus Paris Saint-Germain. My name is Oriko Ampofu and that's how we wrap up the sport for this first segment. Right to sign for showbiz and Becky. Is it? Hello, Becky. Hello to you. Hi. Easy. Okay. I almost said something. Yeah, don't go there. Okay, please. So let's congratulate Dinah Hamilton. Okay. Uh, she just uh, won, or she won the most streamed artist of the year, the most streamed female artist of the year. Uh, the three music awards, we know that the three music awards is coming off later this month. All right. But there was a branch, a, a women's branch that was held, and uh, Dinah has a message after receiving the award. That uh, she's the most streamed, streamed yeah. act. I would want to believe that this streaming includes YouTube. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, I'm one of those who's uh, been to I YouTube know. a number of times just listening. And to you, you, you're saying, you're, can you do it? Raise your voice a little bit. Not, not to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give that to you. Do time. you know MOG? MOG Music is, yeah. he's a gospel musician. He uh, says that he don't mind working with the LGBT plus. Is it LGBT? LGBTQI plus. QI plus community. I mean, he has his own reasons why he's been saying that. I, I don't mind working with an LGBT person. Um, there are people that need to, um, you need to show them love. If, if we are saying that what they're doing is wrong, the only way we can correct them is through love. Um, but when we despise them and you know push them away, it's not going to bring any change. They'll still keep on doing what they are doing. So when you show them love and you preach the message of Christ as it is, the original content as it is to them, um, it brings them to light and to bear that look. Probably what we are doing is wrong, or we need to do it this way rather. You know, this is the right way, and all that. So you show them love, you teach them the right way, and before you know it, they change. Right, so we all tend to be working with uh, people. We don't ask for their sexual orientation before mm -hmm. we, we do business with them or no. we work with them. No. We, don't, we don't have a choice. Yeah. Let them go about their business. Um, yeah, we don't know. I don't know what your sexual orientation is, do I? But I have a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost had a boyfriend. I almost... <laughs> okay. But uh, let's... I don't have a boyfriend. Okay. Oh, why? Why is, why is, why do you just, have to actually bring it up? I don't, well, you brought it up. Let's talk about, have you taken your job? Yeah, I have. Okay, I so have. Adam is telling everyone out there, Ghanaians, to make sure that you take your job and just disregard all the myth around taking the job that it will make you forget things, it will make you... Yeah, I mean, all, the, all those um, theories yeah. that they put out are, are unjustifiable. And um, I've, I took, I've taken my job. I can actually share my video. I posted my video on, on uh, yeah. Facebook. And I so, can share that So video. Adam is just, yeah, I think we should pull that up. Uh, Adam is just, you know, adding his voice to the president's voice, right. your voice, yeah. and everybody else. Make an informed decision on what has to be done. Don't make your decisions based on perception, based on what your assumptions are, based on what you've heard other people say. Do your due diligence, research, read, find out, and it will help you to make the best decision in these circumstances if the vaccine is something you should take or not. But it shouldn't be based on rumors, it shouldn't be based on tabloids, it shouldn't be based on what you see on social media. Get the facts. Final words, Bravo Nation, Bravo Nation. Right, so I, I, I took my job, nothing has happened to me. Yeah, do, do we have that video, David? I'm not sure if we do, but uh, we'll get that video before we end there. So uh, b before we go, though, uh, Moisha, it's her birthday today, and she decided to remake Beyonce's diva video or song. So Moisha is like the only uh, new musician who has released a video without a song. Moisha? 
Yeah, Moisha Boudon. She's an actress. Yeah, and you say she's a musician too? Well, she... She just... Released. So I decided to put together the actual video. Okay. And Moisha's video, just... We're, we're going to put that... Becky, you should put that on our Facebook page and yes. ask people whether it's a hit or but, miss. But, but what, do you, what do you think? I mean, I think for the first time, you know trying something out and this is queen b you were talking about and she did it i don't want to say flawlessly she tried okay so 80 percent you'll give her 80 percent yeah how about you all right okay let's get to see my uh, vaccination video oh oh that's Close that's ready. oh yeah all right so did yeah. you feel any pain though no not really what? i just uh, uh, i just sat there and just asked them to give me the job they gave me the job and but, I, but you had you know, you know so. uh headache after yeah, yeah, yeah. Headache later on me too yeah I had okay. headache. I, I thought I was hallucinating at some I also point. have um, Arava Kumsen's video. Okay. And I have Asher Isa's video when saw, they both took yeah, the job. Uh, do we have Aisha's video somewhere? Uh, maybe tomorrow. Okay. See, I just took it. So, so, like so I, pe people should go out and there then I, and I, take I, the... And then I gave everybody else a wink when I was done. Oh, you, you, you gave them a wink? <laughs> everybody. <laughs> it's a special wink, like winky winky stuff. It's for... Special people. Okay, like. all right. Thank you very much, uh, Becky. Let's uh, say hello to Joe Metal. He's watching. Oh, um, hi, Joe Metal. He said that he's working on something that will blow the minds of, you okay. know, gospel lovers, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you're doing that, then I'd also want to say uh, some sh a shout out to um, Pusha. And oh, wife, yeah, Elon. it's 14 years yeah. of love. Yeah, they've, been, they've been celebrating. I tell you, on, uh, the pool pictures. Yeah, yeah. Damn, we can't right. post this here. So congratulations <laughs> to you guys. Yeah, we love you. Okay, so that'll be it for uh, Showbiz. But there's more news on the Journey's Channel Tuesday station. A mass burial will be held for 12 teenagers who drowned at their Palm Beach on Tuesday. District authorities say they have concluded discussions with the families of uh, children in that regard. The arrangement was announced on Wednesday when a government delegation led by the Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture Development, Mavis Hawa Kumsing, visited a Palm to commiserate with the victims' families. Richard Kodunyako has more in the following report. <laughs> The survivors are out of their hospital beds and have been recounting varying tales about how they got to the beach and how they nearly lost their lives. We went to the beach to play football. I didn't know what happened thereafter. All I saw was that we were struggling. When I gained consciousness, I realized that they had brought me to the beach. I was gasping for breath. We went to play football and we decided to go and watch the sound of our bodies. We only went there to play football and nothing else. That's all I could remember. Parents of the deceased still cannot come to terms with the death of their children. They recount varying tales of how their kids left the house and how the news of their death was broken to them. They came to tell me that my son had gone to swim and had drowned. It was heartbreaking. They told me that the elders were going to examine the situation and would come back. All I saw was the lifeless body of my child. Kofi is 60 years and attends school. Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development, Mavis Hawa Kumsin, led a government delegation to condole with the families. On my opinion, so, I bring you condolences from the president. The president is also a parent and knows how it feels to lose precious ones like this. This is something that has not happened to just one or two people, but 12 teenagers. The country has indeed lost very precious souls. These children would have grown to occupy varying positions, both locally and internationally. He sends me to condole with you and that if he could do anything including pain so that the children could live, he would have done so. 
This is very unfortunate. God gives and God and takes. So Take it. Oh my penny, say me me shame odi. Na me kan chira mo say. Nyame le ni mo say nti. Ya je wa ya nti ase. Madam Howard Kumsin presented some financial support to the families. For the traditional authorities, she urged them to perform the necessary rituals to prevent a further occurrence in the future. This is in Regina Omapeni Anemu, Motreka, Osmoti Omobeye Nina. The DC acted on behalf of the president when this unfortunate situation happened. He settled the mortuary and the postmortem expenses that amounted to over 6,000. We all know there are a lot of rituals to be done, and so the president has directed me to give the traditional authorities 10,000 to help in the performance of the necessary rituals to avert future occurrences. The president says we should give every family that has lost a child 1,000 Ghana cities to help assist them in the final funeral rites. The president says whatever is left, he would be ready to support. I hear for now, a paya be a was a day, you know, you'll find you a paya no nasa. Or how we SMBC is So far, two parents have come out to complain that their children left the house on Sunday but have not returned. District authorities have concluded discussions on a mass barrier with the families of the 12 teenagers, and the mass barrier would come off on Tuesday, the 16th of March 2021. Richard Kwejunya Akon, Joy News. The brother of the 43-year-old woman allegedly killed by her husband in their East Legon matrimonial home says the deceased, Lilian Dejo, is a victim of domestic abuse but was scared to leave her marriage. The accused, Prince Charles Dejo, who is a group executive chairman of a conglomerate that deals in gold refinery, oil and gas and mining, has been charged with murder, remanded in police custody and is expected to reappear on March 22 after allegedly killing her on March 6. Hans Peter Blas, who says his sister is a victim of domestic abuse. Before the recent assault, there is a known occurrence dating several years back, which was resolved. However, since this tragic incident, her friends and confidants reveal she has over the years complained to them. My father called to break the news in a very short order. Yes, she did. And the contents of the video is all over the internet. The complaint was that an argument led to her husband assaulting her, which the husband did not deny when confronted. We're hopeful that events leading to my sister's untimely death on the 6th of March, especially the occurrence of the brutal assault on the 1st of March, among other things, would definitely lead to us having justice. Well, joining us via Zoom now is a member of the Coalition on Domestic Violence Legislation in Ghana, Adolf Uku Bekwe. He's also a clinical psychologist. Now, your coalition is calling for comprehensive police investigations into the matter. Now, how did the DV Coalition receive this message? Is this just an isolated case or this is really happening in many homes? Hello, Adolf. Hello. All right. So I'm asking, uh, how are you seeing this particular case? Is this something that typically happens, that a woman who, as the brother is saying, tends to be abused in the home, refuses to leave and uh, continues to stay in the family? Thank you very much. And um, our deepest condolences to the bereaved family. It is true, this is typical of domestic violence. Um, victims going through horrible experiences and failing to really step out of the relationship for so many reasons. Um, where to go, uh, how to take care of the children, sometimes a family helping them to resolve the issues, not the right way, you know. So it goes on and on and on. And by the time a woman, the research we have indicates that by the time a woman even steps out to the police station, assault might have happened 33 times. And the statistics even go to the point that uh, one out of three Ghanaian women have had been assaulted, have had experience with physical abuse in a previous relationship or existing relationship. So it is very, very prevalent in our country. 
Now, how much abuse is too much? That is very interesting. Um, it doesn't have to go beyond the first assault. One, one punch, one insult, one psychological, uh, an episode of psychological abuse. It's more than enough. The point is that it shouldn't even happen. You know, so one is more than enough for an action to be taken because a push, throwing acid, just one act of assault could result in death. Now, uh, Adolf, we've heard um, the coalition and many advocates talk about the fact that women should just leave these homes immediately there's abuse and you've just uh, reiterated that but this isn't ending why is it the case that or will it ever end and what will it take for women to just or people who abuse generally to just get the message that i need to leave well it will end or be drastically reduced if society raises it as an issue. We all go to bed, don't talk about it, or talk about it sparingly until there is a huge case like this. Then it is making the news. I think that there, must, there is a need for sustained advocacy and intervention. Now, it is at the level of intervention that we are having difficulty. We have the legal frameworks to respond yet what it takes the material resources needed to make this happen we do not have dosu is there but dosu alone doesn't resolve issues of domestic violence it takes shelters it takes psychological intervention it takes training there are so many multi, multi it is multi-dimensional and we need a coordinated response and I think that as a society, as a nation, we are not doing well. We are not doing well. And it is a pity that it must come to this point. And I have said early on that, yes, this has resulted in an unfortunate incident. A woman has lost her life. There are many ongoing, as we speak, that do not even register anywhere. Okay? And it will take really serious intervention, effort on the ground, sustained effort to provide services, to hold perpetrators accountable. There is so much impunity in the system. There's so much impunity. And so it takes a concerted effort, the center absolutely holding. Yeah. Well, you've already indicated that you yeah. already indicated that it's important that we have the systems in place and the structures, dosu, and all of that. But you can have all that in place if the woman or the person who is a victim is refusing to speak up or report, this is not going to go anywhere. So would you probably encourage others who witness or know about these things, such as the brother, for instance, to go report? Oh, yes. I mean, any, with any person who witnesses, medical doctors, you know, any person who witnesses abuse can report. And we encourage people to report. And of course, we know the police will not expose you if you report. And it is also very important for me to emphasize that when such cases are, report, are reported, the police really uh, take it seriously. Okay, so it is going to take a whole family to ensure that we sustain this edu uh, education and intervention. All right. Okay, I, I, I don't encourage women to stay in abusive relationship, but the question that you ask, where do I go? If a woman is in need of a shelter at the moment, where does the woman go? If a woman is in need of medical report and doesn't have money, where does the woman go? If a woman goes to report to the family, would the family believe her? Or would the family say that could go and settle? Let us settle it out of court. Let us settle it. It is nothing. They will go to church. The church will say, let's pray about it. There are many, many things. 
that we need to get right. I mean, the, the, in, the, in, the, in the faith community, they will tell you that, okay, God hates divorce. And so you, you, the, all around you, you are encumbered. Right. The woman is alone. Any victim is alone in this exercise. And I think that we, are, we, we all must uh, bow our heads in shame for, living, for, for really, really leaving them alone to suffer. Mr. Okay. I want to give you 30 seconds. Just uh, look into the camera. I'm sure there are many people who are watching right now who are victims and uh, who probably may be contemplating suicide or may be probably be getting close to the point of death. I want you to speak to them directly. Well, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm talking to all victims, potential victims. You don't deserve to, abuse, to be abused. No one deserves abuse. Uh, marriage is not one of the crosses, bad marriage is not one of the crosses that you have to carry. Um, be aware of the signals, be aware of the red lights. There is help for you. There are hotlines available that you can call. Don't stay in there and die. It is not a virtue to endure abusive relationship. No one should convince you, not your mom, not your dad, not your pastor, to stay in an abusive relationship and cut your life short. That is reprehensible. Step out and live out. Step out before something like this happened to you. All right. Thank you very much. The App Foundation has a hotline, 0243-777773. Don't wait. Call now. Choose life and don't choose marriage. At the intersection of life and marriage, please choose life. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Adolf Uwuku Bekwe. He's a clinical psychologist. And I just want to reiterate that if you're watching us right now and you happen to be a victim or a potential victim, please, it's not worth your life. We don't want you to die because you allowed yourselves to be abused and stay in an abusive uh, marriage. Please do something about it. Now, the National Health Insurance Authority has moved in to support Yawa Ankara, the fiscally challenged woman with a special needs child whose story was heard on Joy News. The authority on Wednesday visited Yawa to sign her and her child onto the scheme for free and also presented them with some medical aid. Joy News' Beryl Ernestina Richter was with the team and filed the following report. Yawa has since the story aired been visited by officials from the Rebecca Foundation who went bearing gifts. Director of Membership and Regional Operations of the National Health Insurance Authority, Ben Kusi, said his team was also touched after watching Yawa's story. We heard about the plight of um, the family, that is um, Madame Georgina Yawa Ankara and um, Vanessa, no, no, and um, on Joy FM. So as an organization, we were asking, what can we do to support them? And uh, we thought going forward, they would definitely need access to health care. And then that is what we do. So we felt uh, in the, what they've gone through, we need to be able to provide them with free national health insurance card that will give them access to free health care in um, all the accredited facilities or credential facilities across the country. And so we are here this afternoon to present to Madam Georgina Yawa Ankara and uh, daughter um, Vanessa Nyonyo a national health insurance card and some items that we brought along. He urged as many Guineans as possible to join the NHIS, as it's been of great help to many, including those who find themselves in a similar situation as Yawa. The National Insurance Scheme is for all of us. Whether poor or rich, we advise you to enroll National Health Insurance Authority. That's the only way we can sustain the scheme and hence be able to take care of those who, don't, who are the needy those who are the vulnerable within our society, we've even made it more easier for those who have cars to actually renew using any mobile platform. So long as they have a, a mobile money wallet, 
they can use the star 929 hash to do their renewal. With the coming in of the, um, let me say, Ghana card, right? You are, if you have a Ghana card, you can also use the same platform, which is a star 929 hash, to link your um, national health insurance card with um, your Ghana card. Because going forward, we are going to be able to use the Ghana card to access healthcare. An elated Yawa expressed gratitude to the team for the gesture. You are wrong. You are so people. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, Deputy Director Marketing of the NHIA Oswald Isuya Mensa commended Johnny's for highlighting the plight of Yawa. Joy FM, of course, all credit goes to you for making this possible. We ask that you continue to touch lives the way that you do. Yawa's neighbor who acts as her caregiver said there's been tremendous improvement in Yawa's condition since her discharge from the hospital weeks ago. Hospital any wo bale ni modru mo bi an ehi ehi kemba. By God's grace there has been significant improvement in her health since she was discharged. She now eats three times a day. She also appealed for more sanitary items for Yawa to help keep her clean and tidy. We need more sanitary pads and antiseptics for her. We also need PPEs like Veronica buckets and other forms of water storage for her so she can maintain the COVID protocols and also be independent. Beryl and Estina reached this report for Joe News. Elsewhere, an 84-year-old woman has been displaced following a rainstorm that destroyed her home at Avatakopo in the whole west district of the Volta region. Paulina Doe, who is disabled in the right arm and limbs on the right leg, has been compelled to convert her small kitchen into a living room to keep her belongings and pass the night. She is therefore appealing to the government and other philanthropic organizations to come to her aid as life has become unbearable for her. There's more in this report. Paulina Do has spent her entire life living in Avetakbo, a satellite community in the West District. According to her, she is childless, hence relies on some relatives and community members for survival. The 84-year-old lived in this mud house and makes use of this building as her kitchen. <laughs> I think if relatives and community members do not provide me with food, I am unable to farm due to my condition. Unfortunately, a rainstorm in early February caused damage to the building. She was only able to take this bag which contains her clothing while other belongings got trapped in the collapsed building. Paulina was left with no option but to convert her small kitchen into a multi-purpose room. It is a kitchen during the day and becomes a bedroom during the night. My house was destroyed last month by a storm. I can't do anything because I am disabled. My belongings are trapped in the room. Some other residents were also displaced by the storm. More than 20 houses suffered severe damages due to the storm. It was indeed a catastrophe here in Avetakbo. Of uh, February in the evening, I was called by one of the citizens from the town of Avetakbo and informed me that um, there was a, a, a heavy rainstorm which uh, destroyed a lot of houses, including mine. 
I inform my chief and the queen mother that this is what is happening in the town. I am suffering. My house is collapsed. I will be happy if I can be provided a befitting building and a kitchen. Paulina and the other affected residents are hoping help would come in earnest to help them to reconstruct and roof their houses as it has been difficult to get a suitable place to lay their heads. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Avetakbu. Now, many Ghanaians who would normally wear the locally made smock, the fugu or batakari, with a hat made to match. But do you know that the way you choose to wear that hat communicates a certain message in traditional circles? You could actually get into trouble with the chiefs or a spiritually fortified person in the community, depending on the way you choose to fold the topmost part of the hat that usually accompanies the fugu. For our Ghana Man series, join us as Upper East Region correspondent Albert Sori visits the fugu market in Bogotanga to get a better explanation of the various meanings portrayed by the different styles of wearing the fugu hat. Now, we have all visited one of these smokes markets anywhere in the country to purchase for ourselves one of these beautiful Ghanaian traditional outfits, the batakari or fugu, or simply the smock, depending on how you prefer to call it. Many of us, when we buy a smock, would most likely buy one of these hats to accompany the smoke that we buy. But what you probably did not know is that how you wear this hat communicates a certain meaning traditionally. You probably also do not know that if you wear this hat the wrong way in the presence of certain people in our traditional settings, you could get yourself into trouble. You might even end up paying a fine. I'm here at the Bolgatanga Smokes Market to talk to Isaka Mukaila, who has been selling smokes for over two decades now, to tell us the different meanings that come with the wearing of the hat that accompanies the smoke. Basically, the, the hat, it has a meaning of wearing it. To the best of our knowledge, the chiefs only have one way of wearing it, except they want to wear it a different style. But the style that the chiefs are wearing, what they do is that this is how the chiefs will wear. So if they wear it and they will pull it back, so if they pull it back like this, it means that they have a lot of followers and they are head of communities. The other thing is that when when you go where there is a lot of chiefs or you go to chief palace and you wear it the way the chiefs are wearing, you are telling them that you are also one of them. So if you are not one of them, there is a lot of implication. Normally they have things that they will charge you to pay. Goats, ram, sheep and cows, depending on how the chief will take the issue. <laughs> so therefore, if you are not a chief and you are a layman, you don't have to wear it the way the chiefs are wearing. Uh -huh. The layman, like some of us like this, we, we can leave it this way. If you leave it this way, you are only acknowledging the presence of God at everywhere you go. That one, it has no any implication. If you don't want it this way, you can pull it this way too. That's the right hand side. So the right hand side, the literal meaning too is that you belong to everybody, whether old, young, you are friends with anybody. So you don't have problem. <laughs> So if you don't want it the right hand side and you pull it the left hand side, basically it's still the same meaning this way. It's still the same meaning. Ah. The other style is that when you pull it in front like this, it shows that spiritually you are spiritually strong. So 
if you are spiritually strong, this is how you wear it. So if you are spiritually weak and you don't have a lot of juju, you don't venture to wear it this way. Because if you wear it this way, and anybody who is spiritually strong may see you and think that you are also strong and he wants to try his juju on you to see how you are also strong. So therefore, you don't wear it this way. So after what I have learned from Munkaila today, I have decided that I will always wear the hat for my smoke this way. At least I'll be telling people that I am everybody's friend and I don't have a problem with anybody. What I certainly do not want to do is to wear it this way and maybe invite a spiritual attack for myself. Whichever way you see it, we are in the Ghana month and traditional beliefs, traditional connotations or whatever you want to call it are all part of the Ghanaian culture. So the next time you buy one of these, just be careful how you wear it and where you wear it the way you wear it. From the Bogatanga Smokes Market, my name is Albert Sorry, reporting for Joy News. Well noted, Albert. That'll be it. We're taking a break now, and then we're bringing you more business to stay tuned in. And we're back with business. Economist Professor Godfrey Bogpen is asking the government to be moderate with its econo economic projections so that expectations are not dashed. President Akufado in his address to the country Tuesday projected a growth rate of 5% for 2021. How government hopes to attain this will be outlined in the budget presentation slated for Friday. Professor Bogbin has been outlining some of the areas government has to tackle to facilitate quick post-COVID-19 economic recovery. We have to be moderate with our expectations mm. because um, um, COVID has done a lot of havoc to our economy. Uh, we are not alone, even though in terms of the real impact, we can see differentials across the continent. But broadly, the impact is very pervasive. To that extent, in, in the presence of uh, a higher expenditure, a new expenditure patterns have emerged. That has to be contained in the face of collapsed revenue envelope and ballooning public debt. There's, there, there's the need for government to look at the macro framework in order not to throw it overboard and create instability. To that extent, I, I would urge that we are a bit cautious in terms of our expectations. Of course, you could get disappointed anyway, because budget at its baseline is an in, it represents intentions. We cannot substitute that for accomplishment. Beyond the presentation of the budget, that is where work starts. How do we convert all the expectations and the projections into actual and all of that? Just look at um, what happened in 2020. A couple of months before 2020, less in November, we presented the 2020 budget. Mm -hmm. We were very hopeful. Mm -hmm. The assumptions were there. We grow GDP by 6.8 or 6.5%. Revenue grew up by this. Three months into the implementation of the budget, COVID hit and all the assumptions could no longer uh, uh, hold and we had to revise that and growth decelerated right. sharply so, so these must, are projections we must, we must be more there, there, there is there is the need for government to anchor the expectations of the private sector in this budget well, economists with Data Bank, Courage Marte, however, believes that government's target of 5%, which is higher than what has been projected by the IMF, is attainable. He says attention must be paid to the manufacturing sector if government wishes to make this a reality. We will not be so quick to rule out the possibility of recording a 5% growth in 2021. And I mean, first of all, if, if you look at our own quarterly report which we published in the first quarter of this year, specifically in January this year, we observed and projected that growth for 2021 could range between 3.9% to 4.9%. And so if the government is seeing their growth forecast around 5%, well, that won't be too different from the upper band of our own projection, which is 4.9%. And I would not be quick to rule out their five percent growth expectations and there are a number of reasons why we should not be that bearish 
on on the growth outlook even though we need to be cautious the first point to note is that the economy contracted in the second quarter of last year and in the third quarter of last year at least now based on these contractions this low base has been created and it will serve the basis for calculating the growth rate in 2021 the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association is calling on the government to provide real estate developers some tax incentives ahead of the budget presentation on Friday. According to the vice president of the association, engineer Stephen Debra Ablomati, tax rebates due to waivers, among other incentives, will help estate developers to contribute to at least 2 million housing units each and every year to curb the country's housing deficit. What we have realized is that there is actually a glut in the high-end uh, property delivery because each and every one of us want to engage in uh, development where they can actually make some returns. But the point is we have a lot of demand for buyers for affordable housing. People are not interested in developing this affordable housing for 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 able Ghanaians who are ready to take delivery of these houses because of lack of motivation and incentives that is associated with that particular segment so what we are looking forward for government to do for us um government having come out with strong initiative of uh good set up uh, uh um, what he call going to set, set up uh, uh, a, a whole ministry that will focus on affordable housing to be able to deliver housing to Ghanaians. We're looking forward that we should be able to have some incentives coming out of this, uh, you know, for developers getting things like tax rebate, getting things like import duty waivers, developers who actually focus on affordable housing development, just so that we'll have the motivation to um, deliver housing to Ghanaian. And of course, that's how we end business. My name is Charles Ayete. Coming up next is sports this day. Andre Ayu, let's come back to Ghana, where President Andrew Kufado says his government is committed to some supporting the development of football. The president made these comments when the Black Satellites presented the under-20 Africa Cup of Nations trophy to him at the Jubilee House. He then went on to charge the team to work hard and even go on and win more laurels for the country. We, have, we do have more for you in the following report. The national under-20 team paid a courtesy call on the president of the country, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado, to present the trophy they won in Mauritania. The success was the first time Ghana has won the competition in 12 years. The last time the country did was in 2009 in Rwanda. The president of the country said he is committed to providing all the necessary support for the game in the country. It's obvious what my responsibility is. And that is to give sports in our country, especially football, the maximum support of the government. And we're going to try and do that. We're going to do our best to do that. Because without the support, it's difficult to go forward in any endeavor in life, especially in sports. We've seen what the modest support that was given to you, how it has played itself out. So that's my responsibility, and I want to assure you that I'm going to do my very best to discharge that responsibility as effectively as possible. Big achievement, and it's, 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 it's the first of what I hope is going to be many, many, many cups for us. I want all of you to be very proud of playing for Ghana, and to be prepared to step up any time you're selected to play for Ghana and more importantly, to prepare yourselves to be part of the Black Stars down the road. It's been 37 years since the Black Stars last won a trophy. President Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado said this current crop of Black Satellite players is the nucleus of the next generation of the senior national team. It's time that the Black Stars won the, well, Africa, the African Championship again. Long overdue. And you have the nucleus. We've proved that you have the nucleus of the side that can do it. So the whole world will be looking at you from now on 
So in terms of training and discipline and making sure that you keep fit, please, don't let this one first uh, success go to your head. You have to stay firmly committed to all the things that your trainers and the fitness and the, uh, the technical team tell you. The discipline especially is so very important. It's the discipline that will keep you out of injury, which I know as a footballer is the biggest um, problem confronting every footballer. But with discipline and the determination that you've shown in winning this cup. The satellites in December 2020 became champions of Waffle Zone B when they defeated Burkina Faso in the final last year. Before we wrap up, let's quickly catch up on some Champions League action. And our main game is Paris Saint-Germain versus Barcelona, which is currently live on Joy 99.7 FM. Paris Saint-Germain took the lead through a penalty by Kylian Mbappe. Barcelona getting their equaliser through Lionel Messi. Messi had a chance to give Barcelona the, a 2-1 lead when he missed the penalty right on the brink of halftime. In the other game, Liverpool are being held by Leipzig 0-0. And Liverpool would certainly be happy with that result, considering they have a 2-0 aggregate lead. And that's how we wrap up the sport here. My name is Arik Wampo. All right, and that'll be all for the bulletin for this evening. I'm Israel Lai. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.